Hello and welcome to everyone tuning in for the live filmmakers talk, the documentary spotlight on the Donut King as part of the 24th annual Vancouver Asian Film Festival. My name is Natasha Jung, founder and executive producer of Colty Collective, a media platform for, by, and about Asian millennials. And we are absolutely honored to be a media partner for VAF this year. Now, VAF, I have to say, has a very special place in our hearts because that is where the idea of our own media platform was inspired from. It was in 2017, or actually 2016 that I, now that I think about it, that I attended the festival and I was truly inspired by the incredibly talented filmmakers and really realized the importance of culturally specific storytelling in particular. But of course, before we dive into the Q&A, I want to acknowledge that we are, on, are broadcasting from the land of the unceded territory pardon me, the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. So um, great, great opportunity to give um, you know, respects to those that, whose land that we you know, live on and work on and play on. So if you are joining us live, please be sure to comment where you're joining in from as we'd love to see who's tuning in. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Alice Gu, writer, director, and producer of The Donut King. There she is. Hey, Alice, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Good, good, thank you. Okay, firstly, I have to ask, where are you located right now? I am in Los Angeles, California. Got it, got it. Okay, so we are on the same time zone. Um, so really appreciate you you joining in. Um, and first, and actually, firstly, congratulations on the film. And you know, really great to have you as part of VAF this year. How are you feeling with um, all the festivals? You know, online and you know, previously in person. <laughs> Gosh, you know, I, I guess it's a little bittersweet. It's really exciting. I guess we've done, I'll say this, after South by Southwest canceled, which was going to be our premiere, mm -hmm. you know, like my, there was a pit in my stomach and I was like, oh my God, this is, we're going to be a, a, a ghost film, they call them, you know, completely forgotten. The festival is canceled. We didn't have distribution. And it was just, it's a pretty sinking feeling. Mm -hmm. But since then we've, we've had decent momentum in festivals and it's been fun to meet a lot of people virtually, but I'll say bittersweet because it's just not the same. I really mm -hmm. like meeting people in person. Um, you know, I have been to like, you know, Sundance before for not my own film. This is my first film, but um, you know, films that I've DP'd before. And it's so fun and it's so special. So we are missing that for sure. Mm -hmm, definitely. Of, of the film festivals who have innovated and have pivoted and been able to, you know, continue on in an online virtual format and really, really happy to share the film with, with your audiences. Oh, wonderful. And yeah, and certainly yeah, VAF is no exception. Um, you know, if we were able to celebrate all together in person, we certainly would have rolled out the red carpet, had a great time, a great party out here in Vancouver. Um, but, you know, that being said, like, I understand that you actually had a, a live in person, you know, safely distance and such a screening in California uh, recently. I would love to hear about how that went. We did. So that was actually a dream come true, you know, because I really wanted to see it with the family members, with the cast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and really be able, you know, have them be able to experience it on the big screen. And there is one theater who, that was open in all of California, and that was in the Santa Ana Costa Mesa area. We drove down, so it was about, about 45 minutes from me. Mm -hmm. and we drove down, and it was actually a great theater. It was a 250-person theater, but limited to, I think, 25 or 30% capacity. But we sold it out, and it was the first time the theater had been sold out in, like, eight months. Wow. And we brought donuts and, <laughs> and, you know, Ted is in Cambodia, so he wasn't able to join, but Christy was there, the kids were there, grandkids were there. Mm. And to be able to see people in person and, you know, hear the laughs and to see when people, you know, get really emotional or, you know, at the end when the grandkids are like, thank you for making this movie about our grandpa. We had no idea. You know, now we have a better understanding of where we came from. And that's just really meaningful. That's incredible. And um, it's it's one of those things where, you know, especially if you're in it, if this is your family, if this is your business, um, it's it's your everyday lived experience. And so to be able to capture that in such an engaging way, such a beautifully told story, um, 
I, I can certainly see uh, how that would uh, drive certain emotions. Um, let's go back to kind of the beginning of, you know, how the, the Donut King came about. What was the inspiration or impetus for you to tell this story on film and why was that important to you? So a couple of years ago, I had a donut that changed my life forever. <laughs> I love that. So I, was, <laughs> I was a new mother and we'd hired a nanny and my husband had gone to one of the high-end, you know, bakeries in our neighborhood and brought home these gourmet donuts, you know, the ones that are like $6 and brought home all these pastries. And he offered one to her and she said, no, thank you. I only eat Cambodian donuts. And we're like, Cambodian donuts? We're like, what do you mean? I'm like, these are like $6 each. These are the ones that are like super coveted. And she says, no, no, I only eat Cambodian donuts. And so we're like, what is a Cambodian donut? I was a little bit bothered because I'm, I consider myself a foodie. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what a Cambodian donut was. <laughs> How come I haven't had one before? And what are they? And the next day she said, I found a Cambodian donut shop. And I was curious how she found one because she'd only been at working for us a week and she doesn't drive. And I've been there for eight years. <laughs> and she already found a Cambodian donut shop. And so the following day, she finally brings home Cambodian donuts for my husband and I. And they're on the kitchen counter and we take a bite and it's sweet and fluffy and delicious. But we say, I think this is a glazed donut, right? Just a regular plain glazed donut. And she says, no, but this is a Cambodian donut. And my husband's like, why? What makes it Cambodian? And she says, because Cambodian people make it. And then this was actually the sentence that formed you know, really formed the the heart of the film. I said, well, if a Cambodian person makes an American donut, because, you know, to me, you know, us, us here, like the most American foods are Coca-Cola, hamburgers, and donuts. And I said, okay, so if this is like the most American food and Cambodian people are making it, how is that Cambodian? She says, no, because they're Cambodian donuts. They're less sweet, they're fresher, they're fluffier. And I said, no. Uh, Really? Okay. How is it? You know, it's a thing. So I looked it up and I, you know, I just Googled Cambodian donuts, Los Angeles, and all of these articles came up about the rags to riches story, the mm -hmm. donut King, the refugee turned millionaire. Why are your donut boxes pink? There were all of these different stories and articles that I knew nothing about. And, you know, I read one and I was fascinated and decided right then and there that, you know, there was something that, that I connected to and I, just decide right then and there, I had to tell the story. Wow, and we're certainly glad you did. Um, there's, uh, I certainly learned uh, a lot um, from, from watching the film. I uh, would love to hear uh, what, you know, you learned specifically about, you know, Cambodian American history and culture throughout the filmmaking process. Oh gosh, I learned so much. <laughs> I would say, you know, just as a casual observer, my limited knowledge of Cambodia. I'm like, okay, geographically, I, I kind of knew where it was, kind of knew a little bit. I casually met a couple of Cambodian people. I knew Angkor Wat, you know, and I know I knew about the Killing Fields and Pol Pot. So I knew just about that. You know, it's pretty superficial. But mm -hmm. on doing research in this film, I found that, you know, the U.S. had a lot of a big role to play in the destabilization of the region. Mm -hmm. I, there were so many camp, uh, so many refugees in the first place, just mm -hmm. persons. Um, I also learned that it was, you know, it was a history lesson for me, the first and only time in U.S. history that a U.S. president issued an executive order to receive refugees. Now, if you'll imagine, I mean, we're in we're in the middle of a tumultuous election season right now, but. About two and a half years ago, when we started the film, you know, the guy who was sitting in the White House was always talking every day in the news about immigrants, refugees from, you know, you know, uh, profanity laden, you know, countries. You know how he calls how he referred to those countries anywhere but America, basically, mm -hmm. um, or anywhere besides like Western European, like white countries. <clears throat> Uh, there was a migrant caravan coming from Central America, calling them full of thieves, murderers, and rapists. And, you know, I just thought, I'm like, that's so insulting and that's so not true. And I'm as American as, as anybody. I was born and raised in the country. I com completely consider myself American, even though I look a certain way. And, mm -hmm. 
you know, I learned so much about the immigrant experience. Again, my, I am not Cambodian, I'm Chinese American. My parents did not own donut shops, but I got to really reflect on my parents' experience coming here as immigrants, not knowing the language, coming to a foreign land and having to build everything from scratch mm -hmm. and all the sacrifices that they made for me so that I could grow up and you know, pursue a career in the arts, you know, which is completely different from, you know, typical Asian fare. Um, so I was able to learn a bit deeper about the immigrant experience, the refugee experience, and a little bit about American history and, you know, world politics. Absolutely. And I think you've, um, you know, you really tied that message into the entire film so incredibly well without really without driving it down anyone's throat, you know what I mean, uh, so to speak. Um, I, and it's certainly, you know, especially, you know, the times right now you work, you worked on it, you know, a couple of years ago, but now you know, it's in, in festivals and, and you, you did your, you know, live in person screening and such. And so to have your narrative out there, um, you know, and that story out there for people to see, I think is really impactful and really meaningful. And the fact that it's about food, um, you know, makes it a lot more accessible as well, right? Uh, we, I think we're talking about this uh, shortly before um, we went live here. And, you know, with that food docs are, you know, certainly not new, but they, you know, they certainly have gained a lot more traction uh, in more recent years uh, in, get, in getting support from both independent as well as large production and distribution companies. So I'm curious to know, uh, in creating this, this film, were you looking to differentiate yourself at all from other food docs or were there other food docs that you were inspired by in your, in your storytelling? You know, I would say that it, I never really thought of it as a food doc, even though it is called the donut king. And, <laughs> you know, asked me like, what's the doc about? I said, it's about donuts. So that naturally sounds like it's a food doc. I, I never, I really considered it, um, you know, a, a story about Ted and using his his story to tell the story about an entire community and their experiences mm -hmm. um, and their immigrant experiences. I knew though with food that I could lure people in. Mm -hmm. so, so knowing that we had to go into some of this really dark history in Cambodia, it doesn't get much darker than genocide, you know, killing of two million people at a time in a country whose entire population was 7 million. So nearly a third of the entire country's population was killed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a huge part of the population that was not killed served in labor camps for years at a time and starved and the atrocities. I mean, that it doesn't get much darker than that. And, and I knew that that may not be subject matter that, somebody wants to watch on a Friday night. <laughs> I thought that a lot of people might want to see a documentary about donuts. You know, the Donut King, the name itself would lure people in. And I knew that I could lure people in and tell a story. And hopefully, you know, once they're in, they're riveted. And I could always go back to donuts. Once we went into like a deep dive into something that was a bit darker, we could bring it back to donuts. And so I have heard from a lot of people and it was intentional <laughs> to make it a bit of a roller coaster ride. They're like, oh my God, the peaks and valleys, like yeah. <laughs> donuts, oh my God, this is so, oh my God, yay, we're back to donuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it's a, it certainly is a fine art to be able to do that. I was, you know, on that ride as well. I was like, oh my gosh, why am I crying right now? Then it's okay, donuts. But it's, you know, it, it's that kind of balancing the savory and the sweet, if you will, with the, with the flavors. Um, and all that too. In and the yang. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. The yin and the yang. I also just want to, um, you know, mention at, at this time also that, you know, if you are joining us live, um, you do have the opportunity to ask questions as well. So please start to, um, you know, throw any questions that you might have into the chat. Uh, this is not meant to be just a, just a basic interview. We definitely want uh, questions from the audience to you. So please, uh, you know, uh, throw that into the chat from wherever you're joining us from. Um, so uh, like for me, like when, when I was, um, you know, watching this, um, I kind of took away from it that it was is very much a story also about multi generational businesses uh, and family and community. Um, you know, with that in mind, were there any particular creative considerations that you had in the back of your mind, or you planned out either with you know filming, storytelling, music, film style, the interviewees to really try to make it relatable across generations? Yes. Well, you know. The first, again, that first Google search that 
that I found Ted in the Donut King story, I was already riveted. I mean, his his story is is Shakespearean, right? He, it's it's rags to riches, back to rags, back to riches, you know, and all the stories in between. You know, his, his love story with Christie. I mean, I, I mean, my my jaw was on the floor of of how they met and how he spent 45 days under her bed and, and that <laughs> yeah, we'll and that um that her pair of parents wanted to kill him so i was already riveted and then as we were unfolding and in discovery of the story you know i find all of these different characters that that supported him you know so there was like chai boon who was his cousin who known him since he was two years old and they grew up in the same town and ted sponsored him and helped you know get him on his feet here or Ning Yan, who, who really looked up to him and uh, Ning Yan started a, a business with the pink boxes and distribution company to all of the Cambodians. Um, but I won't necessarily say most interesting, but what really, really stood out were the younger generation, mm -hmm. the generation who are like me, who are born here, college educated, and, and think in a thoroughly, I would say Western way, you know, mm -hmm contrast that in the film with with Mei Li, the donut princess saying like mom we have to gift these donuts to the thrillist and she was yeah. like why would I give away things for free you know which is like completely yeah. of like an older generation She's like mom just trust me we're gonna give away these six donuts and she was like that guy is so rude but then that article set them up for like the next two years oh my gosh yeah and I was like well what's more American than that <laughs> you know, innovation and ingenuity. I, I know I'm speaking to a Canadian audience maybe, but like, you know, we're thinking what's more, you know, pick yourself up by the bootstraps, let's innovate, let's always change and adapt. And the younger kids who are social media savvy, I said, this has to be a story in the film. And these kids are, you know, also like donuts are so ingrained in pop culture, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's Homer Simpson, cops, the music, you know, every, everything I wanted to put a little bit of a fun pop culture glaze on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, also it's just show it kind of hiding in plain sight, how important these Cambodian donuts have been to donuts, you know, actually like American culture, like between the Simpsons, there was that sequence of Pulp Fiction, Parks and Rec, the pink box is recognized everywhere. And you know, you never questioned it, and then you find out that the pink box comes from this guy. Wow. You know? yeah. And that was that was pretty mind blowing when we found that out. Absolutely, I feel like that's just a great. I mean, like when parties can happen again, it's like a great you know piece of party trivia. Oh, did you know that the the pink donut box came from you know Cambodian Cambodian uh, donut shop owners? Um, yeah, I mean, like just just hearing like, you know, over the years, um, how the different donut shops had to continue to to innovate. Um, and they really did rely on, you know, their own their own creativity, but also the support of, you know, like the younger generation, like the kids that were working, um, you know, in their shops as well. Um, there's there's quite a bit of a I guess uh, the theme of of almost maybe not directly in the film but I guess to be able to do that there's a theme of a little bit of a mentorship as well so when Ted was learning um, you know from Winchell's I uh, went through that training program and such then how he also in turn um, you know mentored other people and helped them get on their feet and open their own shops um, how has mentorship played a role for you as a filmmaker in your career oh huge. <laughs> I mean, well, I, I'd be nothing without, you know, the guidance of mentors and all the questions that I asked. You know, I, I grew up in typical Chinese American family who a career in the film, the arts was certainly not something that was encouraged. And my parents didn't know any other producers or directors, you know, that just wasn't in our, in our social network. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked my way up. And as I worked my way up, you know, met a lot of people, not a lot of Asians. Yeah. And, and um, you know, one of the executive producers on this film is Frida Lee Mock, who is a Academy Award winning Chinese American director, you know, winner once, five times nominated. Mm -hmm. And she was a great mentor, you know, going into the, my first feature length adventure. Oh my um, God. I was 
time. I'm like, Frida, what do I do? How do I handle this? And I think it's incredibly important. And I'm so grateful for everyone that, you know, has given me a few answers along the way. And I hope I can do the same for future generations. Oh yeah, no, I, that's really great to hear. Um, and with that too, like, do you have any, if there are any other documentary filmmakers or just filmmakers in general on, on, uh, you know, watching this either live or watching it later, um, you know, what advice would you give to them in, in the spirit of mentorship? I would say don't give up because filmmaking is hard. You know, mm -hmm. they're all, you're all, as Werner Herzog says, the world resists film. So whether that's on a shoot and then it suddenly starts to rain or somebody wants to shut you down or you want to make your movie and you've run out of money. Um, it really takes a lot of grit to, to move forward. And especially now I'd say for any, you know, Asian Canadian um, audience members watching who are aspiring filmmakers, I think this is really the time and this isn't necessarily just to plug my own film, but I, I would say any film that you believe in that has Asian representation on screen, you know, you've seen like hashtag representation matters. And I have to say that I didn't fully understand the depth of that hashtag until this year. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say that in my experience, it's because when selling a film, it makes a really big difference. The person who's the eyeballs, who is looking at your film and maybe wants to give it a go or doesn't give it a go. It's perspective is everything. So, you know, while you said you enjoyed this film and you found a lot of ways to connect with it, um, it's, it really matters. It really matters if, so I would say support. I don't think I'm answering the question actually. I'd say don't <laughs> But also um, continue to tell Asian stories if that's something that you're into. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think our, you know, it's it's a good time for us. And I, one thing that Cambodians have said to me during this, they said, "Oh my God, I never ever thought I would see like my family story." And it's not even if they're actually in the film. They're like, e "I have a donut shop in Texas. I never thought I would see this kind of story mm -hmm. on screen," and that's huge. You know, you feel like validated. Somebody cares about your story. And and I, I think that's huge. It absolutely is. Um, and, you know, just to, to throw it back to just before we went live here, uh, I had kind of admitted to, to you, Alice, that um, I never thought I'd really be into documentaries. Um, but for me, it actually wasn't until I saw documentaries uh, that featured stories of people who looked like me uh, that I started to really understand and appreciate the medium um, of that that form of storytelling and, and filmmaking, because man, like documentary, like storytelling is so so hard. But you know, to find these stories in your community, they're they're just everywhere around you. You just have to know what you're looking for. Um, and in building out your story, um, I would love to know kind of you know what were what were some of the key like questions um, that you asked yourself first? Like, did you, like, were you trying to put yourself in the mindset of like, okay, if I was, um, you know, a, a distributor or like, you know, someone to, to fund the film, like what would I want to see? Or were you really thinking more about like, what is like your own creative vision? I definitely thought about story first, mm -hmm. you know, everything in it, it. I had to be respectful of Ted, and the story and all, and the communities. But when I think the, the line that changed my life, which is if Cambodian people make an American donut, it's still an American donut. So the question at the time was, what does it mean to be American? Do you have to be blonde haired and blue eyed? You know, what, what does it mean to be American? <clears throat> so that was the, the line throughout. We had to be in service of that message throughout the entire film. Um, but I did think, yeah, I mean, maybe I did. You know, I, I thought the younger generation was very important, but I, I first, of course, you know, you're laden with doubts of like, who's going to watch this film and who's going to be into it. And like, okay, a film about like an 80 year old grandpa, like <laughs> is somebody going to be interested in this story. Um, but thankfully people were. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
you know, and and one of the people that were very interested in your story was um, your executive producer, uh, Ridley Scott. Um, how did how did that all come about in getting a, their support? <laughs> oh wow! Okay, so Ridley, um, you know, Jose, my producer, and I, we come from commercials, and you know, Jose does a lot of uh, projects through Ridley's commercial arm um, of Ridley Scott Creative Group. And, you know, I independently knew Tom Moran, who is a producer at, at Scott Free. And, you know, this was really, we knew we, we, we had something special. We showed Scott Free and they're like, you know, this isn't really something that we do. We don't come into things later in the game. We like to develop things from, from the ground up. And he's like, and honestly, we shut down our documentary division. So we don't really do docs, but they saw you know, premise that the cut of it and they're like, we're stupid if we don't jump on this. Like, <laughs> this, is, this is incredible. And I couldn't believe it. Ridley took a look and he said, um, he's like, I love this. This reminds me of myself. He's like, my brother and I moved to America. We knew nobody and we built ourselves from the ground up. So this is a quintessential, you know, immigrant story. And I feel like this, you know, this story takes place in America, but I've heard people in the UK again, who are Pakistani, British, growing up in London. Mm -hmm. and, um, they're like, you know, that scene with, um, you know, Mama Lee cooking in the kitchen with for her daughter. She's like, that could have been my mom. You know, these are all these like really familiar, familiar themes to us that, you know, even if we're not American and our parents didn't own donut shops and we're not Cambodian, there's a shared immigrant experience anywhere in the world. Mm hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, um, yeah, it was, you know, it, it's even said in, uh, you know, in, in the very end, like one of the last things uh, in the film about how we're all immigrants, right? So we're, we're all, we all came from somewhere, right? Um, and, you know, to be able to, to tell that story, um, and also learn the stories of others are, is, is quite, is quite wonderful. Did you get any um, specific feedback from people who were not Cambodian or not Asian that, that saw the film? Yeah, I, you know, I, Again, when I started the film, I was like, oh, cool. This is like an Asian story. Mm -hmm. And I thought Asian people would really like it. Uh, but my producer, Jose, he's Colombian. You know, he came to America when he was 12. And it really resonated with him. And we have another producer who is Persian. And it really resonated with him. And it really dawned on me that it's not just an Asian story, you know, or even a, a friend who is. Polish or Italian, you know, mm -hmm. and their grandparents came to the U.S. through Ellis Island, you know, mm -hmm. and started with a couple of produce carts, you know, in, in New York City and, and now have our, big, you know, produce growers. You know, everybody has a start, you know, when you come here, um, you know, or anywhere. You, you, you got to start from the beginning mm -hmm. and, and build your way up. And we definitely heard that from all across the racial spectrum. It was not just solely Asian people. Got it. That's great to hear. Um, and, and certainly there are, you know, there's so many, it's just, they're human stories, right? They're American stories. They could be Canadian stories as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's certainly, you know, if, if you can, as a filmmaker, it's, it's really a huge part of your job to really bring the humanity out uh, in these people um, without, also erasing what is unique and and special or specific to their own particular narrative. Um, I, I also uh, would love to know, um, you talked a little bit about some of the challenges in, in the filmmaking process. Um, what was a, what was, I mean, I know it's such like a cliche question, but you know, given the the nature of the the subject matter, and also you know, weaving in like donuts, and then like ooh, like really dark, like genocide, and like all that. Um, but even like you know, the family dynamics, and talking about like, um, you know, just like the, the you know, Ted like falling apart from his family. What was the most difficult part of putting the story together for you? Um, you know, for a lot of what was very difficult was getting a lot of people to agree to be on camera. Mm. So I would say, and you know, the older generation of, I'm generalizing here, older generation of Asian people, they just want to keep their heads down, keep a low profile. They don't want any, cause any trouble. They don't want to bring attention to themselves. So like, Hey, can we, can we, uh, 
film? And they're like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, it was easier to get like mainly the donut princess to agree. And I say, Hey, can we get your mom? And she says, my mom would not be down. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, Ted was down but then I got his kids and then like some older kids were down. Christy, you know, everybody was super, I mean, they're, first of all, maybe, I don't know if they were suspicious, but they were just like, why do I want to do this? But mm -hmm. second of all, for that older generation, you're reopening really traumatic wounds for them. You know, mm -hmm. maybe they're traumas that they hadn't thought of in decades mm -hmm. and for, for good reason, you know? Um, so I say that was really challenging was to gain the trust of the family and, you know, to really allow me into their lives. And it's, that just took time and persistence. Mm -hmm. How do you, gosh, like time and persistence, like in, in terms of building trust with your subjects and asking them to go to deep and, and dark and, you know, often hopefully, you know, they try to forget about places. Um, how do you, I mean, even like maybe even selfishly for myself, cause I'm curious to know, like, how do you encourage people to get there? How do you build that rapport with people? Um, gosh, it, I think it just, <laughs> it's hard to say. It's, it's, I think that you have to come from a very earnest place yourself. I think people can sense if you are not true with your intentions mm -hmm. and if you're not trustworthy and if you've, you know, if you're going to be exploitative in some way mm -hmm. and, you know, hopefully they perceived and I think they did, you know, that was never my intention. I just really wanted to honor them and tell their stories. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's how we, how we built that trust. That's great. And, and I know it's like, I kind of put you on the spot there. It's, it's tough to come up with like very specific things there. Cause I think it really depends on, you know, I think to your point, also like your own personality as well. And like, how do you communicate that genuine, you know, interest and that genuine, um, you know, support for, for their story and, and wanting to, to tell their, their story in the most authentic way as well. Um, so uh, I do want, I'm, I am going to take a look at uh, the questions that have come in and I do have a couple more myself as well, but of course, if you have not yet, uh, thrown in uh, any of the questions, um, please do so as well. So this question is from Rick Chung. Hey, Rick, nice to see you. Uh, you know, he's been, um, you know, in the food industry uh, and, and the blog, uh, food blogging industry for a long time now. So it's great to see him on this event. Uh, Rick's question is, how was it integrating the graphic design elements and animated sequences in the film with the documentary footage? With the documentary footage. Wow, uh, good question. Um... Hi, Rick, thank you for asking. Uh, well, we knew that we would have a lot of archival from the war to work with. But as far as personal stories, we knew that we were going to be lacking, of course. Like, pictures were so precious. First of all, they were really expensive, so they were hard to come by in the first place. And if there were any in existence, when you are leaving your home, you know, you only have 30 seconds to pack up your home, a lot of times pictures don't make it. So they were very, very few and far between. And I knew that we had to visually tell the story in a way that wasn't just talking heads. Mm -hmm. um, so it was important to me to find a Cambodian artist. And I found Andrew Hem. So he is a friend of a friend and he is just incredible in his, in his technique. And his work is so distinct and great. Like it was, I just knew right away that it had to be him. And I asked him and God, I was just delighted to find that he said, I'm interested You know, we didn't have much money either, you know, in his, mm -hmm. and he said, you know what? I'm interested. I have a personal connection to this. I'm a donut kid. My parents own donut shops and I think wow. my parents knew Ted and I worked in a donut shop, you know, until I was a teenager. And in here, he's like a celebrated artist and he works as a fine artist. And I'm like, wow, he went to Pasadena Art Center, one of the best art schools in the world. And he's the kid of refugees who came here and, and made it, you know, in a donut shop. So mm -hmm. getting Andrew's work was, God, that was just incredible. And so I worked with him and kind of frame by frame and storyboarded it out, like how I wanted to tell the stories and really capture the emotion. And, and I, I feel like he was able to do that in his, in his artwork. The, the other graphic sequences that we had in there, um, you know, our, our title sequence with Day One Song. So if anybody 
any sharp-eyed people or skaters out in the audience who recognize that that was day one song, like legendary pro skater and donut aficionado, um, day one agreed to skate through, you know, the streets of Southern California in search of donuts. And we just really wanted to bring like a really cool poppy element to it. You know, as he skated through, we're like, okay, I wanted him to skate and like ollie over pink boxes or like think of all these different tricks. So I really approached it like a video game, you know, where he had, you know, like trails coming from behind him. And as he, you know, as he would hit a pink box, like little donut fireworks would come out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> there, what could, you know, when you think of donuts and, and everybody just thinks pink, sprinkles, cream, fun, you know, so I really wanted to, I really wanted to hammer that into the visual experience. That's well, I would say mission accomplished. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, hopefully Rick agrees as well. <laughs> um, certainly there are, you know, so many different elements as a writer, director, producer to to consider um, in both pre-production or pardon me, in, in all pre-production, production and post-production. Um, but you also added the element of actually filming in uh, Cambodia. Um, what was that experience like for you? And had, had you been, uh, been there? You said you hadn't been there before, right? No, that was my first time to Cambodia and second time to Cambodia. And, and it was incredible. Uh, it was incredible for me to God, be in Phnom Penh by the Royal Palace. I mean, that's kind of walking through this history and, and experiencing, you're standing on exactly where again, millions of people were killed. You know, we were out in the countryside, in the fields, and, you know, by the capital, by the palace. Like, that's where, I mean, they just ruthlessly killed so many people. So that was a really deep experience, um, heavy experience. Um, and I wanted to also make sure to film at Angkor Wat, you know, the kind of the most visually recognized symbol of Cambodia for, again, any casual observer who only knows of Cambodia for maybe like Angelina Jolie or Tomb Raider, you know, so we really, wanted to get, we really wanted to get Angkor Wat in there, but also that was to show sense of culture, history in place, you know, and what an incredible country that Cambodia is and was, you know, even at the time of, of war. And I really wanted to show, you know, how special it was that nobody willingly lives their home. You know, nobody, people who are forcefully fleeing their homes as refugees, even if it is a shithole country to you, I mean, to, to somebody else, that is home for somebody. And that is, you know, where they feel love, security, their mother's cooking, playing with other kids. Nobody wants to leave that. And I really wanted to showcase Cambodia as yeah, just a, a beautiful place, which it is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, um, you know, just just to hear the stories and the recollections of the families that had moved over, either, you know, as adults, you know, adolescents, or even young children, even to hear that they still remember very specific things, like actually being able to, you know, take a shower for like, you know, <laughs> um, uh, it, you know, and the smells and the temperature. Um, that is, it's something that, you know, we, we like, I, at least I personally, you know, often take for granted, right? And so just to hear those accounts and recounts of that experience of coming to a new land um, is quite, uh, it, it was the way that you were able to visualize that was really um, impactful uh, on me. Uh, we have another question here from Yuri. Um, so Yuri's question is, uh, the fallout between Ted and his wife was devastating to see. Absolutely agree. Um, did the film help their family reconcile in any way? Uh, good question. Um, and yes, um, you know, when I first interviewed the older kids, Chat and Savvy, and getting them to agree was like pulling teeth, you know, and they pretty much expressed it in there. And they're like, yeah, we don't really want much to do with them. Like, we don't really talk to them very much. Like, they're pretty resentful of their childhoods, you know, being child labor, you know, which, you know, they didn't get to watch Saturday morning cartoons. They had to be pouring coffee, you know, at, at six in the morning, eight years old and the gambling and what they, you know, what the mom went through. But I feel like I'm doing this long interview session with them, which Chris Combe, the youngest kid, he's like, ah, oh, 
good luck talking to my brother and sister. There's so like, you're going to have the most boring interview ever. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, they don't talk much, but it ended up that, you know, maybe these were thoughts that again, that they were opening up for the first time. It was actually therapeutic to actually confront mm -hmm. some feelings and resentments. And I feel like a peace and an acceptance was made. So when Ted came back, you know, I feel like he has a really good relationship with his kids now. And when I said, when he went to the, the screening and they're like, thank you for telling that story about our grandpa. Like maybe it's an acknowledgement of man, the difficulties of coming to a country. You're coming from a different country, a different culture. You're doing the best you can to try and survive. And, you know, he wasn't immune to the demons of the seductions of the casinos, but mm -hmm. maybe in doing this film, they were able to see an overall bigger picture of the good mm -hmm. and all the families that, that Ted's family helped. Mm -hmm. um, and Christy as well, you know, it's hard for her, but I, you know, seeing her at the screening, she said she loved it and that she cried. And, you know, it was hard for her to see, you know, relive some of those memories, but, mm -hmm. but I think it was really healing for her. That's really great to hear. Um, it's, it's sometimes you just, you don't know what kind of response you're going to get from people. Um, but even just, you know, weaving in that story of, or I guess the narrative of acceptance um, and forgiveness uh, through the end of it too, despite everything that, you know, that happened or went down or went wrong or didn't happen and all that um, really helped, I think just kind of, you know, humanize um, Ted um, and his, you know, his, his journey as well, as well as the journeys of other folks that, you know, were impacted by some of his decisions. And so I'm, I'm glad that you were able to, to draw that out from the people that you interviewed. Um, you. you know, it was actually really fun now that I thought of Christy and like all those memories. It was really hard since no pictures existed and I, I needed to work with Andrew on the animation. I'm like, well, what did your villa look like? You know, and I had all these different pictures of villas. I'm like, did it look like this or did it look like this? Mm. And I ended up talking to Christy's sister who said she remembered better. And everything was in like detail. Like if you notice the details of the cars, there was a Citroen de Cheval, it was a Nash convertible, they had a Jeep, the dog was a Belgian Malinois. I mean, they were like, Christy's sister during the transition government, her sister was the first lady of Cambodia. I mean, that is how high ranking oh, wow. her family was. Yeah. I mean, they had, foreign cars, foreign dogs, guards, you know, she described exactly like the patio, the upper level, the, the stoop and how Ted jumped into the house. So that was all based on like oral, you know, oral history. Right. And her telling me and I, <clears throat> we drew our interpretation of how she described the home. Right. And now there's, there's a visual interpretation of it, right. Mm -hmm. That will also contribute to that history and, you know, the, the family history and the family story. Uh, we have another question here. We're just going to be wrapping up in a few moments uh, from Royson. Um, the stories of immigrants can be so inspiring. What led you towards telling an immigrant story? And do you have any plans to tell similar stories like Ted's in the future? Oh, you know, Ted's story, again, it was so inspiring. And it, and it, yes, it gave me a deeper understanding of where I came from. You know, basically, I I I cut my parents some slack. You know, <laughs> I would just say typically like Asian parents are kind of they're hard on their kids. Mm -hmm. and I know my brother's got a lot of resentments, and just, again, this is the you do the best you can. I've never had to uproot myself and say move to Istanbul and not know a soul. I can't speak Turkish. How am I going to find a job? Like I can't even imagine doing that. So, so I, I, God, you know, it's like kudos to, to immigrants for figuring it out. Like I'm, you know, I'm here, I speak the language and everything is kind of just set up really great for me. Um, and as far as telling some other immigrant stories, there are a couple that mm. I have my eye on that are so good. Um, <laughs> they're so, so good. Um, one deals with music and one deals with sports. and. Wow. I hope to be able to tell them. I hope so too. Um, you know, certainly you've got me hooked. I'll definitely be keeping an eye out for mm -hmm. all 
of your future works. And I'm sure others that have seen the film and are joining us today or, or watch this talk uh, online after will certainly do the same to try to support you in your future projects too. Um, before we wrap up, uh, one final question from me. Um, what's your favorite donut? Ah, I'm a purist. Um, I like a plain old glazed donut. Just like Uncle Ted. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you again so much, Alice, for joining us today and for celebrating the 24th annual Vancouver Asian Film Festival with us. If you enjoyed the film The Donut King, we also have seven narrative feature films and four documentary feature films. You can also, of course, um, make sure that you vote for The Donut if it is your favorite for people's overall choice. Pardon me, people's Yay. overall choice. <laughs> Yeah, and overall <laughs> performance award. Yes, vote, vote, vote. And we do that at vaf.org slash vote. I feel like voting is just like the thing to do right now because, uh, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you, and we'll count the votes in a timely manner, right? Yes. It's not like what's going It'll on. It'll be above board and like, yeah, like I fully trust the VAF team to do a good job <laughs> of counting the votes. <laughs> no vote <laughs> okay, All right. Wonderful. Well, um, once again, thank you so much, Alice. And um, so for those of you still uh, wanting to check out some more films, be sure to check out our virtual programming available in Canada only from now until November 8th at vaf.org. And of course, please be sure to share your experience with us on social media using the hashtags, hashtag VAF virtual and hashtag VAF. Thank you everyone so much for joining in. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Hope you guys enjoy the film. Take Thank you.